Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Thursday, April 11th, 2024. Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer joins us now. Tony, a pleasure, my dear friend. Thank you uh, for your time. Thank you. Good to be here. Thanks, Judge. Uh, yeah, of course. Nice to join you. Um, late last week, uh, in an interview that I had with um, your uh, former colleague, uh, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, yeah. uh, he made a rather startling uh, statement that, in his view and from the intelligence he has seen, he's convinced that this, and I'm, I'm going to say this. Uh, uh, charitably, but then I'll run the tape so you can hear it for yourself, that the CIA's fingerprints uh, are all over the Crocus uh, concert hall attack in Moscow. So in fairness to you and him, here's what he said. Yeah, This looks a lot like what Nord Stream turned out to be, a U.S. operation. Only the CIA led it. Let, let's face it. We have done as much to create and to nurture ISIS as anything else on the face of the earth, whether it be Abu Musab al zarqawi or any of the instigators of the so-called ISIS consulate in the beginning. We've used ISIS, and when I say we, I mean that agency called the CIA, the same agency that does so many nefarious things in our name. And they have worked ISIS and worked operatives from ISIS in order to do other things. And I'm hearing, and it makes a lot of sense to me, and I'm watching the behavior and the signals coming from Moscow, which are usually very indicative of the truth when it's something like this. And I think that's what Putin believes. And I think the intelligence community in, in, in uh, Russia, whether it's the GRU, the NKPD, the KSB, the FSB or whatever, they believe it too. And that makes this Ukraine conflict a different conflict as of that killing of that many Russians that close to Putin and blame lying, at least in part, with the people who orchestrated it being the CIA. You have a lifetime of experience in American intelligence. What's your take on this? So uh, I agree with Larry on his fundamentals. Uh, I look at it a bit differently because of just the nature of my work versus his work during our time in service. So I see the shadows of what I would term to be a large government-driven effort. One of the things, Judge, I've said already publicly several times to include on the network on Newsmax is that there was something behind this group something of a nation state level support you don't move weapons and that many people uh, that effectively with that precision without some level of of outside support isis k is is not the gru and yet somehow isis we're, we're supposed to believe isis k now has become a sophisticated uh james bond level villain organization that can just do things like these guys are running around in the desert in the mountains with AK-47s and Toyota surfs, four by four. So I was like, I don't see how you go from the mountains and running around being essentially fundamentalist terrorists to mounting sophisticated operations against a first world nation. It, it, it's like, it's there's a there's a big gap. So let's, um, let's unpack this a little more if we could. Yeah. The, the colonel made an unusual. Uh, statement or struck me as unusual in that clip that we ran. This was a half an hour interview. We, we extracted yeah. the parts that address this. He said signals from Moscow are indicative of the truth. How effective is uh, Russian intel? And if you tell me it's good, why didn't they catch this before it happened? Well, the nature of clandestine operations judges to maintain clandestine, uh, you know, covert operations until they are ready to be executed. The, the Russians, I think, are very good. I think they've done a great job of penetrating the Ukrainian uh, military and intelligence apparatus. I think uh, they're generally one step ahead. But if you, again, have a nation state involved trying to essentially mask and, and promote and move things, it's it's difficult to, to, uh, to detect. Um, I think the Russians right now are moving in a direction which supports Larry's commentary, just yesterday, and I'm, I'm stating from Barron's, this is a, <laughs> a incredible news source, the Russians have opened uh, a financial investigation 
into Burisma. There, there's a name from the past. Right. Examining uh, what they believe to be, uh, you know, financially uh, evidence of financial support to terrorist organizations. That is this attack. So, my point being, it's a long way of getting to it. If you've got a sophisticated partner doing things to promote an operation and a peer to the Russians. Yeah, it's it, the chances are pretty good that you will understand how the Russians operate. I did this during the Cold War. We figured out how the Russians operated. We figured out how to manipulate their thinking. We figured out how to move information around so that they would get a certain perception. I'm a Reagan guy. I mean, I talked. I was just talking to Ambassador Hank Cooper the other day about some of the Reagan bluffs they were using to get uh, Gorbachev to think things that weren't true, and we were plugging it into the Russian intelligence system for them to pick it up as if they found it accidentally. So, so yeah, I think that there they could have been a deception or a, a masking of an operation if if ISIS K had a, had a partner to help them. So, Larry uh, Johnson, uh, your colleague and mine, a regular on this show, said in his podcast last night, and we'll say again uh, later today when we have our intelligence community roundtable with Larry and Ray uh, McGovern. Uh, that the evidence of uh, Burisma's involvement, this does not involve Hunter uh, Biden. but Not that we know of. Not that we know of, right. The, but the level, the, the evidence of Burisma's involvement uh, is substantial. Yes. In large measure because you'll know this name, you probably know him personally, of Kofor Black, the former head of clandestine yes. services at the CIA, now yeah. on the board of uh, Burisma. Why would Burisma want the former head of clandestine services for the CIA on its board unless they wanted a little internal guidance as to how to do this kind of stuff? Number one. Uh, Number know, two, is yeah. it the Ukraine um, uh, intelligence totally subservient to MI6 and CIA? So the, the latter first, yes, absolutely. Um, much of the, the targeting data that has been provided to the Ukrainians for purposes of attacking Russia has come through the United States and MI6. It is what it is. And um, the the uh, Ukrainian intelligence service has been focused more on being a dirty tricks organization, a, an organization that's focused on destabilizing Russia by doing what we would consider acts of terror. I'm not accusing them of being terrorists, just so we're clear. Right. But, but I, I'm saying that that their their job is to been uh, in the covert operations business. And gee, Kofor Black was in the covert operations business. Gee, I don't know. Is there a relationship or not? Um, And so, yeah. So I think it's it's notable. And I, look, that's why uh, they've t- they, you know, they've warned Judge uh, Ukraine to back off attacking Russian uh, refinement facilities in Russia. Don't don't raise gas prices. You know we got we got Biden to to reelect, so we control a lot of that, no doubt. And uh, so it's it's kind of a very thin fig leaf of what that is. So on the on the on the first part about you know uh, what's going on with with Kofor and and Burisma and and the larger picture, it's like there's something called the Winsaki syndrome that we get taught when we go through spy school, Judge. It's uh, basically the premise is this. If you meet with someone in an open location and you have a cover that says, oh, I'm really a business guy and I, I, I should not, you know, nobody should be alarmed by seeing me and this other guy together. But th- everybody knows you're a spook and you're meeting with someone who you don't know who they are. But, geez, if you're a spook and, and you're meeting with someone, that person's probably involved. So the, the idea is. Perception's reality. No matter how great your cover is or how great your reason is, oh, I'm really a businessman now. I'm just here to be a businessman on the board. Nobody buys it. And I I think the same can be said here. Your um, feel for the intelligence community in general, of which you were a part for a number of years, could they be, excuse me, so reckless, cruel, and indifferent to human life, innocent human life, as to have orchestrated or facilitated or knew about and looked the other way, whatever, wherever you want to put it along that spectrum. The slaughter of 144 young people at a concert, not a military, legitimate military target at all. So um, have you asked your CIA friend that is off and on with you, by the way? At this yes, point? yes. Anyway. I'm asking um, one yeah. of them right now. 
<laughs> well, look, I, I, I'm not going to lie. I, it's not that I didn't kill people for a living, but I'd like to believe I killed the right people for the right reasons. And in my judgment, I mean, I was a military guy. We, we focus on military targets. We do things that are focused on uh, obtaining and supporting specific military objectives. And we did some pretty nasty things, but n never, in my view, would we, the United States Army, uh, uh, special operations com community, would we do something focused on civilians? With that said, we're not CIA. CIA and, the, and their covert actions group, uh, all that, that stuff, they have a completely different philosophy of the world. That's one of the reasons we don't, I've never gotten along with those guys. That's why I'm not CIA judge. I mean, everybody says, oh, you're CIA. It's like, I'm not CIA. I was trained by them, and I learned a lot about how they operate. And I've I've been in joint operations. All right, so for mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Forgive me for accusing you of being CIA. I know you weren't CIA, and I no, fell but, into the trap of putting all intel in no, the same. No, and, I, and asset, I get it. But you're not. Okay. So uh, just for the audience to understand, there is a division. There are divisions within the intelligence community. Now we there we are divisions actually, in the intelligence community that would kill innocents. Yes. There are. I think that CIA and some of their uh, whiz kids would consider doing this. I mean, we we actually call it's not a it's pretty much open now. Our nickname for CIA operatives were Klingons. If you use the, the Star Trek uh, lexicon of the universe, you know we're the Federation. We we're the you know we're the guys who actually try to keep things going. They're the Klingons out to disrupt and destroy all the time. That was our mm -hmm. view of CIA. And I don't think it's changed that much. I, I have a very dim view still of CIA, even though when Mike Pompeo was a CIA, it was one of his advisors. Mike had to oversee this, the CIA, go through a number of really stupid things. I don't want to get into them here. But I'm just saying that uh, I, I think that there are people at the political level, at, at the especially at the Biden White House, who would be more than happy to think that somehow killing Russians, even uh, innocent Russians, is a good thing. They keep saying this. David Cameron just said this, Judge. Oh, it's great that, that 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 you know you guys are funding the killing of Russians. Why is that great? I don't I don't understand how that's even a thing at this point. That but that seems to be a predicate driving Cameron, Biden, and all the other knuckleheads who are the neocons wanting to go and, and if CIA and MI6 were involved in the planning of this, <clears throat> or if they knew about it and did nothing to stop it, is this an act of war? by the West against Russia? I think Russia has been very restrained uh, considering what has been what I see going on that I think if the Russians chose to be a, a bit more public about it, they would be they would be rattling the war saber. I don't think Russia wants war. I don't. I really don't. But but to your point, I think that that uh, in certain circles, the actions that have been taken plus if the crocus attack can be proven to be Ukrainian in origin, yeah, that's 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 walking up to World War Three, and a lot of us don't want to see World War Three. Here's uh, the comment to which you referred from David Cameron, the British Foreign Minister, yeah. just two days ago. He's standing next to Tony Blinken. In my opinion, he's off the wall, but I'll let you uh, ex listen and express your own view. On Ukraine, the best thing we can do this year is to help keep the Ukrainians in this fight. They're fighting so bravely, they're not going to lose for want of morale. Uh, the danger is we don't give them the support that they need. And I make that argument to anyone who will um, listen to me. I argue that it is uh, extremely good value for money for the United States and for others. Um, perhaps for about 5 or 10% of your defense budget, almost half of Russia's pre-war military equipment has been destroyed for, without the loss of a single uh, American life. This is an investment in United States security. That's the exact comment you were talking about, right? Yeah, and he's he's lying. So first off, American lives have been lost. They just haven't been reported. We've had uh, sustainers and, and retainers over there helping out. People have been killed incidental to being there. Just saying, I'm not, we're not involved in combat ops. People have been killed. So I was like, okay, David, go back to England and have some more Yorkshire pudding because you don't really know what you're, you're saying. Secondly, I did not know it was our policy as the United States to quote unquote kill Russians and give money for people to do that. Did you know that, Judge? I had no, no. idea that that was a U.S. policy. No, I've never benefit. heard the Congress uh, articulate that. And uh, Joe Biden in his, in his most competent and bellicose, if you can imagine him the same at once, never said that. I'm a Reagan guy. And it's like, all right, 
Um, what are we trying to do here exactly? Well, why are we saying that we want to kill Russians? Is is this is that is it killing Russians or trying to resolve the conflict? Which is it? Because the two are not are not necessarily related. Have they have the neocons recognized yet? Depending upon when you think the war started, I think it started in two thousand the, the Ukraine Russian war. I think it started in two thousand and fourteen when it orchestrated a deadly coup. The neocon right coup, yes, Victoria Newland and that crowd think it started two years ago. But whenever you think it started, here we are in April of twenty twenty four. Do the neocons recognize yet that they have not succeeded in using Ukraine? as a battering ram with which to drive Vladimir Putin from office, and they will not succeed this time around. Judge, these are these people are political sociopaths. No, they, they don't care. They don't care. This is something I've learned in dealing with the, uh, I don't want to say names because I'll get in trouble and I'll get you in trouble. I'll just be polite. From dealing with people who have obvious neocon friends and, and, and tendencies, it's all about this projection of what they believe to be the correct and right thing uh, regarding U.S. democracy. They always use this word democracy as their justification for what they're doing. Oh, we're trying to bring democracy to that or democracy to this. You think they're trying to deliver the latest iPhone to people in, in the jungle, for God's sake, the way they, oh, we want to proselytize. And, and they never take the time to understand history, culture, trends, and personalities. Again, I, I've been brought up, I've been mentored by the Reagan guys. And I've, it was not beaten into me, that's the wrong word, but it was reinforced vigorously. Uh, the Re Reg President Reagan would always played the circumstance based on what he understood of the history, what he understood of the culture, and most importantly, what he understood of the man he's facing regarding the leader. They always understood nuance. Neocons see the world uh, where everything is a nail and they want to use a hammer. Period. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. So you are correctly uh, uh, identifying 2014, the Maidan Re Revolution, this idea that uh, that the neocons had Victoria Newland. I can say that name because it's obvious. Right. She she under Obama pushed this whole thing in as as a as a construct of two things. First, Ukraine would become a a, a asset and resource for the EU. That included uh, everything from oil and gas to wheat. And the idea was they will become a partner and a resource and, and they will be ours. Secondly, the, the removal of Ukraine from the sphere of Russian influence would have the effect of, of collapsing Russia, collapsing Putin. And, and they sold that to uh, to the uh, to the West saying, oh, we can do this. It'll be easy. We, we know you. Nobody likes Putin. He's a thug. And he is a thug, but he's he's still like people like him. So I, I I'm not who 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 am I to judge? So it's it's their system. The system of Russian, uh, re the republic seems to work for them. God bless them. Go with God. Do it. Do what you need to do. But they thought to all this, Judge. They really had this idea that oh, we it's it was a fantasy. It was a fantasy based on projection of their internal goals of damaging Putin. Oh, Russia. Oh, Russians are bad. And trying to make the EU believe that, oh, you're going to get this, you're going to get bright, shiny Ukraine all ready for you guys to use. And oh, by the way, mm -hmm. oh, there'll be, if there's a conflict, ah, we'll have, we'll, we'll let you come in and rebuild. We'll, there'll be plenty Here. of money to go around. So on all accounts, they've been wrong and they've never been Here's longer the, than they are t 10 years out. Here's uh, Senator Tommy Tuberville uh, two days ago asking, asking Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, you'll get a kick out of this. If Ukraine can win, cut number 10. General, uh, can Ukraine win? Uh, yes, yes. Well, and, what, does that look, what does that look like? Well, what we've, what we've uh, said all along is we want to see Ukraine to remain a, um, a sovereign, uh, independent, and democratic uh, state that's, uh, that has the ability to defend its sovereign territory and deter aggression. And, and that's been our, our aim from the very beginning, and it remains our, our aim. But yes, they can be successful. Under oath, he says twice Ukraine can win. They can't win. I, look, I know Lloyd Austin. I was in combat with him. I, I'm disappointed in the general for saying what he did. It's, it's a departure of reality severe enough that most people who um, say that level of insanity would be considered for mental treatment. Uh, 
David Cameron said that 50% of all the Russian weapons uh, that existed before they started the, the incursion are gone. They've been replaced. The Russians have replaced all their old gear. Did, did they suffer some, some, some uh, failures, Russia? Of course. But all the old stuff's been kicked into combat, and now they're literally outproducing the West. The U.S. and your EU could not outproduce the Russians at this point regarding military hard work. 21st century, not 20th century, just for, if Joe Biden is listening, 21st century military hard work. <laughs> just to, if he's listening, he might be He might be listening, just to remind him. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't sure of the century. Not the wasn't date, sure, but century, I'm sure. The day. I'm sure. But my point, Judge, I'm sorry I'm distracting here, but my point being is that, no, the Russians, the Russians have been effective in demilitarizing NATO, not Ukraine, NATO. All of the different things we've given them, Judge, the $300 billion of hardware. That's not even counting the EU stuff. That's, they've just shuffled through it. Here's the Russians a, are now using Ukraine as a as a battlefield experimentation uh, presentation. They're just going through and like, oh, let's try this now. That's how bad it is, is that the Russians are not worried about winning. Here's somebody in the Biden administration who agrees with you on the retooling of the Russian military. He happens to be the number two person in the State Department. The second half of what he says is political uh, propaganda, but the first half, uh, Secretary, Deputy Secretary Kurt Campbell, uh, is right on what you just said, Tony. Russia has almost completely reconstituted militarily. And after the initial setbacks on the battlefield delivered to them by um, a brave and hearty uh, group in Ukraine, um, with the support of China, uh, in particular, um, dual use capabilities, a variety of other efforts, industrial and commercial, Russia has retooled. There you go. Thank you, Biden administration, for recognizing that. And, and I'm sure I'm going to get all sorts of in trouble for saying what we've been talking about, because somehow if we say it, we're the ones, oh, you, you're just saying things to be provocative. Right. Like, well, there, no. there you go. From the, the PhD who really runs the DOD, test, uh, um, speaking candidly, here's another Q&A for you. Uh, first, a little clip of uh, Secretary of State Blinken about whether or not he thinks that Ukraine will really join NATO. And then uh, Senator Tuberville again asking Secretary Austin if he agrees. Watch this. Uh, Ukraine will become a member uh, of NATO. Uh, our purpose at the summit is to help build a bridge to that membership. I heard Secretary Blinken say last week in Brussels that uh, Ukraine will soon be in NATO. You agree with that? that that's that's uh, that's the goal of uh, the NATO members is to at, at some point uh, uh, bring Ukraine into into NATO, and that's if, certainly something that Ukraine wants to see. If you're Russia, would you want that? I'm just asking. I mean, we're 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 playing 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 games with Russia right now. I just want to understand why we would do that. Uh, certainly, if I was Russia, I would not want that, uh, Senator. I would also not want Finland and Sweden to be a part of uh, NATO, and they are. And the reason that they are is because Putin invaded his neighbor. And, uh, and you know, without provocation, without justification. And so that's why we want, want that's why we are where we are. Um, and, you know, instead of, uh, instead of <clears throat> making things uh, better for himself, uh, he enlarged, he had the effect of enlarging NATO, which obviously creates uh, uh, worse conditions for him. What do you think? Enlarging NATO that is less lethal means nothing. It's like, okay, you've widened the responsibility without widening the capability. It's like, boy, I don't know who's advising Austin and how what what how he gets told these points. It's like, really? People like me are going to look at him and say, you are a knucklehead. Because, when, yeah. when the world uh, recognizes... Uh, when the world recognizes that uh, Ukraine has been defeated, can a legitimate argument be made that Russia has defeated NATO? No, no, I, I, I don't think you can go that far. But let me go take a step back to the question regarding uh, NATO and Ukraine. Go ahead. The reason they're saying this right now, remember, 
Remember uh, Ted Stevens, Senator Stevens, and the Bridge to Nowhere in Alaska? I saw it, and it is a bridge to nowhere. That's what that bridge is that Blinken's talking about. They don't want. They're not going to give Ukraine a NATO. Even all the NATO states have to vote on it. You got to get uh, you know us here on our side to to approve it. This is a MacGuffin, Judge. Uh, you know, MacGuffin's a Hollywood term for like the the Maltese Falcon. You know, you, you're going through and always watching the Falcon. In this case, the Falcon is NATO. Oh, you want NATO? They're not going to give NATO to the Ukrainians. If this is trying, this is Joe Biden through Tony Blinken uh, trying to get the Ukrainians to just hold on, keep fighting, keep fighting bravely until after November 20, 2024. Then you do whatever you want. This is all about like everything else the Biden administration does, domestic politics. This is putting off the inevitable, a Very, it's already public, but you know, only a few of us are talking about it. They're trying to put off this, this public display of failure brought on by Victoria Nuland and Tony Blinken and the other knuckleheads uh, until after November. That's all they're trying to do is keep that little carrot out there in front of the Ukrainians to keep them hoping for NATO membership. That's all this is. It's a cruel joke.